Hello everybody, welcome to this short introduction and discussion of Christina Rossetti's poem, Winter, My Secret. Right, so Winter, My Secret, published in 1862 as part of the Goblin Market and Other Poems collection. That was Rossetti's first published work. Um, Non-devotional -devo uh, poems, so uh, we're not talking about uh, her faith in this collection. These are a collection of all sorts, some of which we've looked at already. Um, Winter, My Secret is a poem that uses a speaker and an implied listener a technique, a form that we've seen before. So without further ado, I will read it for you. Here it goes. Winter, My Secret by Christina Rossetti. I tell my secret. No, indeed, not I. Perhaps someday, who knows? But not today. It froze and blows and snows and you're too curious. Fie. You want to hear it? Well, only my secret's mine and I won't tell. Or, after all, perhaps there's none. Suppose there is no secret, after all, but only just my fun. Today's a nipping day, a biting day, in which one wants a shawl, a veil, a cloak and other wraps. I cannot ope to everyone who taps and let the draughts come whistling through my hall, come bounding and surrounding me, come buffeting, astounding me, nipping and clipping through my wraps and all. I wear my mask for warmth. Whoever shows his nose to Russian snows to be pecked at by every wind that blows, you would not peck? I thank you for good will, believe, but leave the truth untested still. Spring's an expansive time, yet I don't trust March with its peck of dust, nor April with its rainbow-crowned brief showers, nor even May, whose flowers one frost may wither through the sunless hours. Perhaps some languid summer day when drowsy birds sing less and less and goldening fruit, golden fruit is ripening to excess. If there's not too much sun or too much cloud and the warm wind is neither still nor loud, perhaps my secret, I may say, or you may guess. So, I think quite obvious is the tone of the poem and there's there's a very sort of teasing playful tone going on and we'll have a look as we do some annotations about where that tone comes from um, clearly right from the get-go we're supposed to be intrigued this mentioning of the secret in the title together with the the noun winter um, creates a, a, a sense of mystery or intrigue that, that that hooks the reader into knowing what that secret might be um, i think that Winter, with its connotations of shut down, closed in, um, cold and hard, um, is part of that intrigue. Um, but also that colon in the in the title. Um, I always think co a colon when I'm when I'm trying to describe what a colon does. Obviously, it introduces a lift, but a, a list. But it it can also introduce a, a note of drama, a little bit like two hands going. Da -da. Um, and I think that. It has a bit of that drama, that colon, winter, dun, 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 my secret, making a direct link between um, winter and the secret itself, perhaps. So as we go through, we'll, we'll try and work out what the connection might be between the idea of this secret and the idea of winter and whether or not there is any connection and whether or not there is any secret, uh, which is something that one or two of you have spotted in your annotations. Um, but let's let's get straight into it um, and have a look at stanza one. In fact, before we do, um, just to make a brief note that contextually, in, in manuscript form, um, the working title for this poem was actually called Nonsense. Just the word nonsense. You might have come across this in your in your reading, um, which throws a whole other light onto that tone. That teasing playful tone and also some of the structural choices that Rossetti makes that you noticed in your annotations um, what's nonsense is is the fact of the secret nonsense is the is the whole exchange nonsense um, there's a definite playfulness uh, in the secrecy of, of the speaker um, we'll we'll see where that comes from as we go through 
Um, immediately, one of the first techniques that Rossetti uses to to engage and intrigue is are the rhetorical questions. And we get one straight away. I tell my secret. No, indeed, not I. Perhaps someday. Who knows? So two rhetorical questions in the first two lines. Um, but not today. It froze and blows and snows and you're too curious. Fie. Uh, one or two of your annotations have made a brave effort to identify a rhyme scheme in this poem and it's all over the place. It's just as capricious. And here's a good word. Um, if I can make this pen work. Capricious. That's how you spell capricious. I'm sure you'll tell me if it's not. Capricious means kind of playful or changeable. Um, and just as the tone is uh, changeable, so is the rhyme scheme. It, it chops and changes. And just when you think you've got your, he your head around what it might be, it, it throws another curveball at you. There's lots of internal rhymes as well. And, and, and that gives it a real um, lively, playful rhythm. Um, but not today. It froze and blows and snows and you're too curious. Phi. So we've got Caesura midline with that colon again, another bit of drama. Phi is a kind of admonish, admonishing exclamation, like kind of shame on you kind of, uh, kind of phrase. But again, quite a teasing tone from Rossetti or from the speaker here. Um, you want to hear it? Another rhetorical question. Well, and then a colon for a dramatic pause. Only my secret's mine. And I won't tell. Lots of possessive pronouns. Lots of me, mine, I. Um, lots of possessive pronouns to emphasise with whom the secret lies. Um, and then a structural shift to a second stanza, much longer than the first. There's, again, no rhyme or reason, it would seem, to some of these structural choices, although as we read through, we might decide why this one needs to go on for a little longer. Or after all, perhaps there's none. So here's this first indication that there might not be a secret after all, in which case the whole premise for this poem is nonsense. There might not be a secret. How are you going to know? Suppose there is no secret after all. There's, again, that sort of teasing suggestion. Um, Today's a nipping day, a biting day, in which one wants a shawl. Nipping and biting are obviously um, verbs to do with the cold weather, um, but they're at the slightly more needly end of teasing words. Sort of nipping and biting is the kind of thing physically you might do if you were physically teasing someone, if you were kind of baiting them a little bit. Um, today's a nipping day, a biting day. Is that because that's what she's doing or is that what the listener is doing to try and draw that secret from her or that, that hidden... That hidden idea from her in which one wants a shawl a veil a cloak and other wraps so all of these are um, things that we wrap around so uh, things to obscure or hide um, all of all of these it items of clothing are kind of obscuring her and obscuring perhaps metaphorically the secret which has given some scholars pause to question whether there's not some sexual play going on here and whether the, the the secret is something that the speaker owns that the listener is trying to make connection with is, is is this a sort of is this a teasing banter of that kind of of that kind of tone um she talks about um covering herself and here later she says um i cannot ope to everyone who taps um, and let the drafts come whistling through my hall now, the extent to extend that metaphor then of covering up, she seems to now introduce this up, this metaphor of a door. And we've seen doors being knocked on before in um, shut out. This door is being held closed by the speaker. And she's saying, I can't open it to just anyone. Um, just because you knock, I can't just open it and let this freezing draft to blow through my halls. Um, the, the doors appear in more than one other of Rossetti's poem, and we'll keep our eyes open for them and what they tend to represent. Um, come bon bounding and surrounding me, come buffeting, astounding me. We've got this list of gerunds, which is the verb with the ing on the end, um, again creating that pace, pacey rhythm and, and playful kind of bouncy sort of tone. Nipping and clipping, there's two more um, slightly uncomfortable bitey types of verbs that um, echo the nipping and the biting earlier. Um, again, 
words that we use to associate with the cold um, as well as a light sort of physical attack. I wear my mask for warmth. Okay, there's uh, someone else wearing a mask. She wears her mask for warmth. What is that mask? That metaphorical mask is appearing to be something that she's not or a means of defense or what? So that mask, clearly uh, a metaphor. Whoever shows his nose to Russian snows to be pecked at by every wind that blows. That, that's quite a long um, rhetorical question formed by that in Jean Vermont. So she's saying, who would, you know, who'd be crazy enough to poke their nose out into freezing Russian, uh, Russian snows? Um, you would not peck. This word peck is quite unusual. Obviously, we expect the word sort of pick, but peck has got a, a notion of kind of being jabbed at by a sharp beak. So it goes with biting and clipping and those other sort of tight sort of uh, uh, gerunds. I thank you for goodwill, believe, but leave the truth untested still. So there's that playful kind of, you know, almost fake gratitude at his interest. But, you know, I think I'll keep you guessing for a bit longer. And then she goes into a discussion of some other seasons. And we know that Rossetti's used the seasons before as um, a symbol for nature's unchanging cycles. But here she introduces the idea of seasons as being um, capricious and changeable um, and something that she uh, might not trust. She starts with spring and introduces spring as being an expansive time, expansive meaning um, expanded or outward looking or growing or, or open armed. Um, and then Caesura again with a colon, yet I don't trust March with its peck of dust. And again, this word peck, um, have a think about why she's using that word peck, what else it could mean. It's a kind of kiss as well, isn't it? A peck, which might link back to the the reading of this being a kind of a kind of playful banter boy girl kind of banter um, nor April so she's still in in this kind of spring um, section nor April with its rainbow crowned brief showers rainbows again in our current situation are, are, are held up as being symbols of hope here she's saying a rainbow is short-lived um, it appears in the sky and then it goes um, nor April with its rainbow crowds, rainbow crowned brief showers, nor even May, whose flowers one frost may wither through, um, through the sunless hours. So she's saying that uh, she's, you know, why, why is she not uh, associating her secret with other parts of the year? Well, it seems that they, they're too changeable, too untrustworthy. Perhaps, she says in the final stanza, perhaps some languid summer day, languid's a great word, I don't know if you've come across this word languid, it's the adjective, meaning sort of um, relaxed to the point of torpor or sleepiness, torpor's a great word too, um, torpor means a kind of when you're drowsy and slow with heat or, or tiredness, you're languid, it's kind of very, very, very chilled out kind of word. Perhaps some languid summer's, uh, summer day when drowsy birds sing less and less and golden fruit is ripening to excess. If there's not too much sun or too much cloud and the warm wind is neither still nor loud, perhaps my secret, I may say. So she's building up, building up, building up. Oh, maybe this is when she's going to tell her secret. Quite sensual description of summer here. It's, it's kind of ripe and in fruit and it's a sort of mixture of summer and the ripe, ripest bits of autumn in this in the illusions of this final stanza she's saying if everything was perfect if conditions were perfect perhaps we've got if and perhaps those two kind of speculative words there if and perhaps perhaps my secret i may say or you may guess so it finishes with the whole point that we're led to believe from the title the divulgence of this secret we're left with it remaining ambiguous and, and teasing. So the whole poem works as a bit of a kind of playful tease. She does it with the rhyme scheme that is impossible to pin down. She does it with um, internal rhymes that kind of give some of the stanzas almost a kind of real rhythmic kind of bouncy pace. She uses dramatic caesura to introduce a note of... Um, hesitation pause wait for it wait for it I'm not going to tell you we've got 
um, lots of nature imagery which can we can tie in with some of the other poems that we've studied um, nature being perhaps dealt with as being a little more fickle um, maybe we'll add that to our changeable capricious fickle um, something that changes its mind a lot um, and I think that ties with the tone of the whole piece now as before I'd like you to think about what speaker is what what, what aspect of Christina Rossetti is this speaker where does that tie in with your increasing your growing understanding of her as a person and the world in which she lived and which is tempting always to be to overlay um, literary texts with autobiographical contextual links um, but ha have some fun with it try and try and pull out some some possible links with this this tone this playful tone is it the Christina Rossetti that we've heard from before um, I'm thinking perhaps of the poem um, that was addressed to a certain John. Um, it's certainly not the same tone as the more devotional poems that we've looked at. Um, is this a different side of Christina Rossetti? You'll be thinking about her romantic life such as it was. Um, the fact that she worked with those women in Highgate. The fact that um, she was a, someone who kept herself covered um, in a kind of metaphorical way. Certainly in her adult life she wasn't um, keen to be kind of overexposed in in the in the pre-raphaelite visual arts she was she was as you would have heard on the uh, excellent in our time podcast that i linked to in um an email earlier this week and i'll put in the description below in that in our time podcast one of the scholars in the studio uh, points out that she was unwilling to be painted as Rossetti. She she would she appears in lots of her brother's um, paintings, but she's often playing a role. She's often Mary or, or or somebody else, not not herself. She's she's not re representing herself. She was wary about being overexposed, and I think there's a bit of that in this poem with all the the clothing coverings and the and the 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 obfuscation. If I'm saying that, never mind spelling it, um, obfuscation. Is that right? You'll tell me if it isn't. Um, which is the process of deliberately clouding meaning or throwing up uh, barriers to clarity, making things ambiguous, making things cloudy or, or mysterious. Um, there's a lot of that going on in this poem, and I think it offers a, a another side to Christina Rossetti. And I, I think from some of the comments that I've I've heard from you, she's starting to come alive um, as a an interesting um, an interesting mix. Or of traits as of course real people are so I hope you enjoyed the poem we'll be picking up on this poem again a little bit later when we draw comparison with other poems in the collection for the OCR A level um, please uh, drop me any emails if you're one of my students or use the comments below if you wish if you're coming across this uh, from somewhere else in the country um, winter my secret Christina Rossetti Hope you enjoyed it. See you next time. All the best.